Should we get started? Hang on. Let's get started. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, because many people, sorry, went quite fast, and so uh, there's a lot of questions. You should ask me many more questions later on, but let's just try to cover one that several people have asked, the same one, which is why, why are we parameterized by quadratic differentials, or where does the omega come from? So just before we carry on, let's just think of what that omega there is doing and where it's sending us to. So that omega there is going from k to the half to k to the minus a half tensored with k. And remember that earlier on today we said if we had homomorphisms from a vector space uh, to another vector space, then we could think of these as v1 dual tensored with v2. And this is what we're having here, right? We're having a map from a vector, so from a vector bundle to another vector bundle. So we think of all of that, the space of those maps as, go as k to the plus a half. So we put the dual here and then we keep the yellow ones with the same order and that's where we come the k square. So all of those omegas, the space of those omegas is the space of sections of k square. Okay? So, We've talked about uh, Higgs bundles, we've talked about stability conditions, we've said that we were going to call the moduli space uh, M, M and D, the moduli. So the moduli space of isomorphism classes of semi-stable uh, Higgs bundles for fixed degree D and fixed rank N, this space has inside the cotangent space, so the, sorry, the tangent space to n and d. When, when n and d are co-prime, remember we were thinking about the tangent spaces and so we're going to have, um, actually, we're going to have the cotangent space as, uh, sorry, it's key. This won't be too important for us, but it's just a, a link to what we have been learning before. And this moduli space will satisfy very similar conditions to the one of vector bundles. So when n and d are co prime, then it's smooth. It's a quasi projective scheme in general. Sorry. For those that like algebraic geometry, projective scheme. And uh, it satisfies many properties that we're going to come back to. And I'm not going to talk much about them right now, but they will be important tomorrow. So it is hyperkähler. This will be something very important for us. And also, if we have there will, be ha there will be actions that preserve the stability of, uh, of the Higgs bundles. So note, and one of the important ones will be that if E and phi is stable, so E phi stable, then we can act by C star on this pair and remain stable. So E phi, if I put E and I put lambda phi, stable for a C star action. So for lambda, sorry, C, let's put C. C inside C star. So this moduli space of Higgs bundles has a very nice action that preserves these stability conditions too. If you were to take an automorphism of the vector bundle, and you start with a, a stable Higgs pair, you take an automorphism of E, and now you pull back phi, you also stay stable. So there's also an action by automorphisms. Uh, we're going to use that a lot, but before we do that, I want to go and generalize one step more what we were doing. So, because we can generalize vector bundles into principal bundles, so Vector bundles, so vector bundles have just a vector space, like if we had an action group of GL and C, we can put other action, other structure groups. And 
We can do the same for Higgs bundles, and that's quite a nice thing to do. So definition, let G, so let G, C, and now the only groups that I want to take are the A, B, C, D groups. So either the general linear G, L, and C, or A, B, C, D. So S, L, N, any of the S, O, Z, N, or the S, B, N. You can do everything for any more generic Lie group, and the whole theory just carries on. You just need much more work, and we don't want to go into that. This is already very, very rich area. So for any of those groups, a G, C, Higgs bundle, GC Higgs bundle is a pair if now we're going to have a principal bundle, so it's a pair P phi for P principal GC bundle. So now our vector bundle is not just a vector bundle, it has a structure group, and phi is a holomorphic section of the adjoint bundle associated to P through the adjoint action uh, tensored with K. So before we had a section of the endomorphisms of E tensor with K, now we have a section of the adjoint bundle of P tensor with K. We're going to see some examples so that this is a bit too theoretic maybe, but what you'll see is that for all of these groups it just boils down to our original definition. We just need to put extra conditions. So what happens if we take what happens if we take GLNC? So for GC equals to GLNC, we recover our classical definition that's up there. Recover classical definition. So all of these that we're saying it's still back from the papers of 87 of Nigel Hitchin. Okay. If we put GC G, L, and C, we recover the classical ones. If we put any of the other ones for G, C, all of these subgroups of G, L, and C, all we need to do is we need to add some extra conditions to our space. So get classical Higgs by looking at the vector space representation of your P plus extra conditions. So what are those extra conditions that we're talking about? We don't need this definition. Well, we'll keep this definition because all we're saying is that we need just this definition plus conditions reflecting the nature of the group. So this is how it's going to work. For example, say that we take GC equal to the symplectic group, SP2 and C. So what we're saying is we need to take the, a principal sp 2 nc bundle and a Higgs field, which is a holomorphic section of that joint bundle of P tensor with K. A principal sp 2 nc bundle has a representation which is given by a vector bundle with a symplectic form. So a Higgs bundle, so it defines a Higgs bundle and sp 2 nc Higgs bundle. And we're going to put it with vector bundles E phi for E a rank to N symplectic bundle, or let's put vector bundle with a symplectic form. Symplectic form. Um, going to be a bracket and phi is going to be going from E just like we did before from E to E tensored with K but compatible with this form so such that um, when we do phi V well, 
w is equal to minus v phi w. So this is what we call a compatibility condition. Compatibility condition, and this is just our bundle with our principal bundle structure. If we take an orthogonal Higgs bundle, what we get is an ortho a vector bundle with an orthogonal form and a compatibility condition. If we were to take uh, if we were to take the special linear group, then it gets quite nice, and the condition for a special linear group gets quite simple. So, in the case, let's keep that for later. In the case, we've seen the symplectic group. As I said, the orthogonal group is not too, too different. If we take this special linear group, you think of special linear matrices in the special linear group, they're traceless, they have determined one, so you can foresee what's going to happen. So here, continuation of that example, for GC equals to SL, and C defines Higgs bundles If I, where, and now the fact that S L and C has traceless and trivial, determ uh, trivial determinant is going to come, uh, or that the Lie algebra has, is going to give us the following. So, the top exterior power of our vector bundle, where E is a rank N vector bundle. with the top exterior power, so the determinant of the bundle being trivial. This is what we call the top exterior power, is what we call the determinant. And that's where the determinant being one appears. And the trace, the trace of the Higgs field is equal to zero. Trivial? Oh. Trivial. Oh, this is trivial. Trivial. Trivial bundle. Thank you. Yeah, I said it and I didn't write it. Um, so you want the top exterior power, your determinant bundle, to be trivial, and you want your Higgs field to be traceless. And then what you have is SLN, C Higgs bundles. Yes? Yes. Just a trivial, the structure shift, if you want, shifts, yeah. Uh, so we can come back to our example and we'll erase it after this, I promise. But let's come back here and let's try to figure out whether there is anything that appears here uh, showing in our example. So we look, at our, we look at our vector bundle and we try to see what is the determinant bundle of this one. So the determinant bundle is, the, it's a rank two, so it's the square of this. The square of a rank two bundle, which is the direct sum of two line bundles, is the product of those two line bundles. But these two line bundles are dual to each other. So when we product them, we get the trivial bundle. So the determinant bundle of E is indeed the trivial bundle. It's equal to k to the half tensored with k to the minus a half. And we chose the k square, uh, k square root. And when we look at the Higgs field, the Higgs field does have trace of the Higgs field equals to zero. So here, instead of saying just a rank two, a family of rank two Higgs bundles, we can go ahead and we can put SL two C Higgs bundles. Yeah, we're going to take the standard representation. That's a great point. What happens when you take different representations? It's, uh, it's somehow studied, but it's not completely studied. So understanding different ways in which you can embed, or so you could construct, in, you could embed it in vector bundles of much higher rank, right? Yeah. Uh, and many times this open question, what is happening? So we're taking the standard representation here. Yeah. Um, no, I see. So, so when you say like a, like a G6, that takes me, my principal bundle, to a vector bundle. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm trying to work with matrices in my... Yeah. 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 Yeah
vector spaces, yeah. Yeah. What, sorry? Where's the dependence on the embedding? So I thought it was like a section of add p transfer. Yeah, but the add is the GL and C add. The GL and C add joint representation. Yes, it makes sense with the adjoint bundle, but once you want to put it into vector spaces. So I think Tengren, what the dependence he's mentioning is going from the definition uh, that we had there to actually the working with vector spaces and vector bundles. Yeah. So, so also, is the determinant trivial? Is that the same saying that uh, uh, rank is zero? No, the rank, so the determinant bundle will be always a line bundle, right? We're taking the top exterior power of a vector bundle. We're always getting rank equals to one. Uh, what we have is degree. You mean degree, maybe? What? You mean degree? Yes, that's fine. Uh, degree zero. It's not the same as saying degree zero because there's line bundles which have degree zero and are not trivial bundle. But it does imply that it has degree zero, yes. So if you start with something that doesn't have degree zero, you certainly cannot be the trivial bundle. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? So my suggestion was that you thought of as when you take, if you have a vector bundle over your Riemann surface, say so E here, you take holomorphic sections in this space inside here and you look at the number of zeros. There's a much more correct way of doing it. This is not, this is ham wavy. Yes? Oh, this yes, this is dual. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So I tensor one, someone with its dual. Yeah. Okay, maybe this is a point where we should give some motivation of why we're talking about these objects. We've been defining objects more and more, but we want to try and understand them and relate it to things that might be of some use. So what we're going to do is let's just do some of that motivation here. So the multiply space of Higgs bundles. Um, and we can extend the definitions of stability conditions to principle Higgs bundles, so GC Higgs bundles. It gets a little bit tedious. You have to use filtrations, Jordan Holder filtrations. But then when you look at the vector space, vector bundle representation, then it gets almost like the one we saw. So we're not going to go through it, but there is a notion. Just know that there is a notion of stability condition that allows you to define the moduli space depending on the group. So moduli, for those groups that I mentioned, moduli of isomorphism classes, of semi-stable GC Higgs bundles. So stability, although not originally defined, just like we did, one can see that for these groups, it does boil down to what we've done. So it does boil down to looking at subspaces which are preserved by your Higgs field, which satisfy some slope conditions. If we were to take other groups, so not the groups that we put, the A, B, C, D, or G, L, N, then you need to start looking at even more complicating things. You need to start looking at S equivalence classes and that, that won't go into what we're talking about. But let's not go that way. So why do we care? One of the reasons we care about these model I space, this, remember, is this is Higgs bundles. We're going to consider them as E phi with these extra conditions that we're talking about. This is what Hitchin defined back in 87. If you're interested, 
stable bundles and integrable systems has the more generic definition for GC, okay? Uh, his self-duality equations from the same year has the original examples that we were looking at. This is partially very interesting because it's in correspondence uh, with the space of representations, reductive representations, or let me put the plans for reductive representations of the fundamental group of our Riemann surface and the group GC, modulo conjugation. So this is reductive, this is conjugation, Remember that this is our Riemann surface. And this is all through what now we call non abelian Hodge theory. Non abelian Hodge theory. Due to in the lower cases, but there's Donaldson and Hitchin, sorry, and Donaldson Hitchin Corlett and Simpson, so this is the name that Simpson gave in his paper, these are papers from around 89, 90s, and if you just work to consider instead of GC, just re relations between vector bundles without the Higgs field, just vector bundles and representations, it goes back in time before Hitchin even to Yao and Uhlenbeck. So all of these people worked in the correspondence, an algebraic correspondence between the space of Higgs bundles and the space of representations of the fundamental group of a Riemann surface. So anytime that you want to ask questions, what is the cohomology of the space of representations or what are properties of this space, or, or, so uh, the formation properties, for instance, of the space of representations, you can translate back to Higgs bundles, study it that way, and then come back here. So that will be one of our motivations. What is the, that will stay in our mind. There's lots of questions, if you wonder about open questions, there's lots of questions about understanding, for instance, annals of representations or types of representations in this side that don't have yet an understanding in this side. So being able to come back. What we know, or the way that you can think of it, just a hand wavy way of thinking of it, in, it's you're starting with a pair, E phi, so we have the moduli space, this space was the space that's originally introduced by Hitching, a space of solutions of some self-duality equations. Those are equations for a connection, and that connection has a holonomy representation. That's a representation that's going to be from the Riemann surface to, to the group. So it's going to give you, you, you have, from each Higgs pair, you have these representations associated to you. We're not going to see, say too much more today about the space of representations. Instead, what we're going to do is motivate even further the study of Higgs bundles through the natural integrable system that appears. So we're still just taking pairs E phi, where E is the vector bundle, phi is the section, and all we're doing is adding some conditions. So let's just put here to remind ourselves that phi is a map from E to E tensored with K. So, it w yes? Reductive representations. Reducible. Yeah. Reducible, yeah. Ir okay. Irreducible. Irreducible. Yeah. Irreducible. Completely, completely different. Complete, what's the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a representation theory, so I mix up the words. What, sorry? Direct sum of irreducibles. So if you think about from the Higgs perspective, you're going to have to work with polystable objects too. And you might have things that decompose into stable things. Okay? Cool? Okay, so I want to tell you about the Hitching vibration. And as a tool, as a tool that we'll come back to tomorrow, as a tool to study this moduli space, and as it stands, it depends on the space of Higgs bundles, it depends on the, on the Riemann surface, on the complex, uh, complex structure that the Riemann surface carries. If you think about this side, representations of the fundamental group, that doesn't depend on the structure that we put on the surface, right? We could change the structure and we still have the representations. So, in this side, we're going to need it a lot. We're going to have a hitching vibration. Just even defining a hitching vibration in the other side is an open question, okay? 
so what is the Hitchin vibration? It's the vibration of our moduli space, which has a very nice geometry appearing. It makes our moduli space just appear as a vibration, as a, as a space where all the fibers are Jacobian varieties or prim varieties, some a billion varieties that are uh, tangible. So we're going to define it this way. We're going to start with our complex Lie group, and we're going to take the Lie algebra of that group. So let GC be the Lie algebra of the big one. And, and we're going to take a basis of homogeneous invariant polynomials for that Lie algebra. So and let P1 to PK or PR, let me put PR, be a basis of homogeneous invariant polynomials. So the Lie algebra has a ring of invariant polynomials and we're taking a homogeneous basis. It will have some number of elements in that basis and we're going to, those homogeneous, they are homogeneous so they have some degree, we're going to give a name to that degree. So, and we're off degree, d1 to dr. Under conjugation, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you can take any basis, that's one of the nice things that's going to happen. You can take any basis and this will work and we're going to see which basis might be more easy to think about in different situations. Any other question about this? We're fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply those polynomials to our Higgs field. Remember our Higgs field was a section of that joint bundle to a principal GC bundle, and these are invariant polynomials on the algebra, our fibers of the principal bundle of the algebras, we can apply these polynomials. So the Hitching vibration, Hitching vibration, is going to depend on your group, so we're going to have the moduli space of GC Higgs bundles, and it's going to fiber over some base, I'm going to call it AGC. The Hitching vibration maps a representative of classes, so E phi, they map, it maps them to, oh, let me put it here, sorry. Let's put inside here, we're taking E phi, and what we're doing is we're mapping it to P1 of E, P1 of phi, P2 of phi, P R of phi. So this is a very abstract definition. We're just taking a, a section. Remember, we started, started with P principle GC bundle, phi section of the adjoint of P with values in K. Then we went into looking at them in the classical way through a vector bundle and a section with extra conditions. But really the Higgs field was originally a section of at P. So to that section of at P, we start applying all the invariant polynomials. What we're getting here, what is the Hitching base then? We can write it, so where do all of these elements lie? If they lie in the direct sum of sections over the Riemann surface of powers of k. So we had a k here, we apply homogeneous polynomials of different degrees, that will raise the power of the k that appears. So it will be k to the di, for i equals to 1 up to r. So for each of the invariant polynomials, we apply it to our phi, it raises the degrees, it's a homogeneous of polynomial of the degree, we put a di here. This is the Hitching base, so we call this one the Hitching base. We call this one h, the Hitching map. And I want to give you some examples and tell you why we care about Yes, Jeff. P1 to PR depends just on G or it depends on 
on G. So it mm, well, the Higgs bundles are GC Higgs bundles. So that's a great point. When we define the moduli space, I didn't say it. When when we define the classical moduli space, we said we fix rank and degree, right? right? When we define the space for other groups, we will have to def fix the invariance for those groups. So in the case of, say, orthogonal group, we'll have stifle whitney classes. So we'll want to fix those ones. Okay. So we're going to be fixing. Uh, fix that. You fix invariance. You fix everything. You put the stability conditions and fix any invariance that you may have. And for each invariant, you do that. Yeah. Okay, but, but these polynomials are just, you take your Lie algebra. It has a ring of invariant polynomials. You take a basis. And let's take a look at some basis of invariant polynomials. And we can, yes. Right, so it will go, if you take phi square, it will go to e tensor 8k square, right? So what he's saying is that if you take phi square, which is not an invariant polynomial, uh, we'll go from e to e tens tensor k square, right? Because the phi is sending e to e tensor K, and now we apply phi again, so from this E, we go to E tensor with K, but we had a K, so K square. Um, and the powers will start raising. It's a great point because we're going to be taking not square of the map, but we're going to be taking traces, traces of squares. And that's where it's going to come from. So before we put, I guess it, Covered, sorry. Let me. Before we we say a bit more about, or we look at some examples, let me just put a remark here. Remark. And we'll work on those things. Uh, so remark, this map gives an integrable system. So the Hitchin map makes the space be an integrable system. So the dimension of the space over two is the dimension of the base, and for those that care about in or, or that care about integrable systems, you have these. Poisson commuter, a basis of Poisson commuting functions on the base that gives you the integrability of the system. Moreover, the map is proper. So H is proper. So as a proper map, it means inverse image of compact sets is a compact set. So inverse image of a point will be a compact space. So in particular, in particular, Inverse image of points are compact, and the nice fibers, the generic points, give you compact abelian varieties. So in particular, generic fibers are abelian varieties. Let me just emphasize compact abelian. And we'll get back to this point. This will be very important. How, does these, uh, how do these abelian varieties appear? How do we know what they are? What we'll see is that there will be Jacobians of curves or sub-varieties of Jack. So the Jacobian is the space of line bundles of degree zero on a surface or on a curve. And we're going to take either that or sub-varieties. We'll see. Yes. The Poisson commuting functions. Oh, I wasn't going to define them here, but I can I can refer you to the pages where they are. Uh, you can construct these functions on the basis and check that they Poisson commute. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that you could ask, for instance, is if you have your vibration and you know that you have an integrable system, can you get real integrable systems? Can you have a real slice of this model space that gives you everything but in the real setting? There's not many examples of that. 
Um, okay, so what do we know? Before we get into this bit here, either today or tomorrow, let's just put some examples of this vibration and what do we mean? This is for any, the important thing is that all of these is for any basis. Hitchin showed that it's independent for any basis. P1 to PK, PR. So that's quite cool. All of these, all of these properties work for any basis, so choose your favorite basis of invariant polynomials and work with it. What are bases of invariant polynomials? Well, one of the bases that I like the most is the basis given by traces. The map trace of a matrix to the power, that's a basis of invariant polynomials for many groups. So a basis of invariant polynomials a basis of invariant polynomials is given by trace of phi to the i. So why is that basis quite nice? Because the Hitchin vibration will preserve whatever the basis you take, it will be telling us what is the base, right? We, we have here in blue the basis being sections of powers of k to a di. So if I can figure out which of those spaces are empty, I can rule them out and then use any other basis to study them. Yes? Does the basis know anything about phi? No, it doesn't. So let's just put a matrix, A, for, yeah. But my Higgs field is going to be the matrix. Yeah, good point. So we're taking traces of powers of matrices. So what do we know about traces when we take powers of those matrices if our matrix in particular, so then, and this will be important for us, when, uh, so when, when the Higgs field is off diagonal, it's trace zero. And even when we put powers, the odd powers will vanish. So when phi is off diagonal, just keep in your heads that example that we said was going to be very important, E equals to k to the half plus k to the minus a half and phi equals to zero omega one zero. So starting with that in mind, when phi is of diagonal of any rank, then trace of phi to the i is equal to zero for i equals to for i odd. So that's already telling us several things. It's telling us, okay, all of those spaces in blue that have di equals to odd, it's go they're going to be zero. They're not going to be there. We're only going to have even degree homogeneous invariant polynomials, which also tells us if we take an involution that takes x to minus x or the variable to minus the variable, these are even degree, that involution will preserve them. So there's a lot of structure appearing when the Higgs field have this. Uh, and this won't be just these small Higgs fields, the Higgs field will be off diagonal, so this is the case. This is the case for, and there's more than just that, it's the case for any of the symplectic, symplectic Higgs panels and any of the orthogonal Higgs panels. So either odd or even rank, both of them. So for all of these cases, it's going to be of diagonal. For all of these cases, we have this extra structure. So that's one basis of invariant polynomials. We are going to have other bases of invariant polynomials that are going to be useful. And so that base is there. For, it helps me all the time realizing when there's extra symmetries that I might want to use. And you can even go further and say when does when do all the degree four polynomials or multiples of four uh, vanish? And that will give you even more symmetry. But the basis that becomes more useful in terms of the example that we were seeing here is the basis that comes from the characteristic polynomial of a matrix. So remark two. the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial 
polynomial for for matrices A inside either GL, SL, SP, and SO 2n plus 1, see, for any of them give a basis of homogeneous polynomials. So now we come back to what we were talking about, characteristic polynomials. We're going to so then we take the determinant of phi minus the identity times lambda. And if we put a right meaning of lambda, we'll see the objects appearing in this place here. So when I say the right meaning of lambda, we want lambda to be some tautological section. We want it to become uh, an object where close to where phi lives. So tautological. And I'll say a few words about this tautological section. Remember, remember that K is the tangent, the cotangent bundle of the Riemann surface. So a cotangent space of the Riemann surface fibers over the Riemann surface, and he has a total space that is also fiber over the Riemann surface. And so the tautological section of the pullback of K to its total space. So you're, you're looking at the line bundle, you're pulling back that line bundle to its own total space, and then you can evaluate. And there's a section that just evaluates. I'm pulling back to myself, and I'm evaluating myself. So that is the tautological section we're using here. And when we look at this, uh, this determinant, what is this determinant or characteristic polynomial? This will be some A1, or let's just start generic lambda to the n for g l and c lambda to the n plus a1 lambda to the n minus 1 plus plus a sub n minus 1 lambda plus a sub n where each of these a sub i's are sections of sigma k to the i. So I'm not expecting you to make sense of this too quickly. It takes a few pages in, in Hitchin's paper to define and show that it properly makes sense. But just roughly speaking, what you're looking at is you're looking at the characteristic polynomial of what you had was a matrix. We are subtracting something. Remember that your matrix, like we put there, it had some sections of k square. Now we're subtracting something that we're saying is the tautological section of the pullback of K, and we're trying to look at this characteristic polynomial. This characteristic polynomial, these coefficients will be your PIs, will be a basis of PIs. Why did I keep, I should let you go very soon, but why did I keep the, um, just as a small comment, why did I keep here the SO to NC away? Because the last coefficient is not a basis. Last coefficient is not in a basis, in the basis. It's its square root that it's in the basis. The last coefficient is a Fafian and the square root is the object in the basis. But the, so whilst this might not tell you uh, automatically which of these spaces vanish, the other method tells you. And so through the other method, you know which ones vanish. Then you come here and you know that some of these coefficients vanish. This is an affine space, a very nice affine space over which the Hitching vibration fibers and the objects in the base will define some curve and the fibers will be these Jacobians of sub-varieties that we're going to go through tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Tautological section. Oh, tautological. Tautological. Tautological in the sense that it's like a tautological statement. Uh, you're evaluating a point in a point. Um, maybe there's other ways. That's the way that I, uh, I find it easier to understand it. 
you're pulling back, you have a line bundle and you're pulling back that line bundle. It works for anyone, not just for the canonical bundle. Take your line bundle on a surface and pull it back to its total space, right? You're taking someone, pulling back to the total space of that one and then evaluating. Over each point, you are inside the total space, so you get to that point. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is there a way to see uh, the rank or the degree or the slope in terms of understanding the person? The representation, yes, and I think that's much more proper. Okay. If you want to, you guys def work with representations. You have, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, I think I think a correct way of defining the the rank and the slope and invariant. So there's something called the Toledo invariant that depends on them. It's it's much more appropriate to define them through representations. At least it's very uh, concrete. Uh, yeah, I can tell you where to look at if you want. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Laura, one more time. Thank you.